The popularity of river sports is increasing annually. Fishing, canoeing, rafting, and powerboating are common river activities which have shared a surging growth as leading forms of recreational enjoyment. Rivers present a great threat to the unwary water recreationist, low head dams. These structures claim the lives of an increasing number of sportsmen annually. Of all the things on a river that are dangerous, the low head dam is the most dangerous. In fact, if an engineer designed an efficient, unattended, self-operating drowning machine, it would be hard to come up with anything more effective than a low head dam. There are an estimated 2,000 low head dams in the Commonwealth, and if river travel is something you plan for this year's recreation, whether canoeing, kayaking, or cruising, be familiar with the river's dangers. Keep your distance. Those three words could save your life. Tonight, part one of a News 8 exclusive, a revealing report on low head dams. There are about 2,000 low head dams crossing the creeks and rivers of Pennsylvania, and every year they kill people. Tonight, you're going to see why. At this point, the victim is not visible. This is how most people see a low head dam accident. A disaster played out on the evening news. The river batters an empty boat. We cannot see the boat. The boat is under the water. Rescuers search for bodies. We lost sight of the person. We lost sight of the victim. The news cameras capture the action, but never the accident itself. Today, we will change that. We're on the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg, just above the Dock Street Dam. We're going to show you exactly why low head dams are so dangerous, how quickly they can catch you, and how quickly they can kill you. We have a couple of boats, a few foam rubber dummies, and this onboard camera. The Harrisburg River Rescue Crew is joining us today. They're going to be using this as a training mission. And what we're about to show you will drive home the warning that the only way to avoid dying in a low head dam is to keep your distance. This is a drowning machine. It's, the trade name is a drowning machine. It's a killer machine. Steve Ketterer is the commander of Harrisburg River Rescue. He has pulled his share of bodies from the Dock Street Dam. In the past 20 years, 17 people have drowned here. Three of them died in this accident in June 1990. They anchored their boat downstream, but too close to the dam, and crossed what Ketterer calls the magic line. If the craft gets into a certain point of the boil line, it will actually just grab it, suck it right into it. It's a phenomenon we'll explain later, but first, we're going to recreate the accident. You're all right. Yeah, you're well below the boil. Come on up. River rescue teams carefully put our boat with the dummies on board in position near that magic line downstream. And through the onboard camera, you will see and hear what happens if you don't keep your distance. Within seconds, the boat and everyone in it are sucked under, and underwater is a dizzying, dangerous flood of powerful currents, sucking you deeper, shooting you to the surface, and sucking you back to the bottom. This is what it's like to die in a low head dam. every time and here's why the river picks up speed as it's squeezed over the dam that fast moving water passing over the dam plunges to the river bottom and forces the water down there back up to the surface but that water is then sucked back toward the dam by the water plunging to the bottom it creates an endless cycle down to the bottom up to the surface toward the dam back down to the bottom it's like crawling in a front-loading automatic washer, pulling the door shut, and have somebody slug the machine with a handful of quarters. Even with the life jacket on, you're going to be recirculated, and it's a trip that I just don't want to take. Low-head dams catch and kill most of their victims from downstream. Unwary boaters who cross that magic line and are pulled toward the dam in the backwash. But low-head dams are equally dangerous from upstream. They're often poorly marked, and they hide below the water's horizon. By the time boaters see the edge, they're already caught in the current. 
Tomorrow, you will see if river rescuers can reach this boater in time, or if once again, the water will win. Possible victim in the dam at the boat, near the boat. Now, also tomorrow night, you're going to hear a York County couple whose 14-year-old son was one of the victims last year. They are, of course, sad, as you would expect, but they are also angry. And when you hear why they are angry, you will understand yet another reason why you need to keep your distance. That is really frightening video, and I think that for the first time in my life, I see the danger illustrated, and you heard just how awful right. it is to be caught in one of those dams. We often tell you about stories and show mm -hmm. you the tragedy, but you can't explain to people and drive that point home why. And you can't appreciate it from the surface. You really need yeah. to see what happens underwater to get the real picture. Tonight, we are going to show you a killing machine in action and what happens if you don't keep your distance. Every year, people lose their lives in low head dams here in Pennsylvania. There are thousands of them on the creeks and rivers. When they catch their victims, they don't let go and rescuers know what to expect when they get the call. The call to rescue 14-year-old Joe Keller came in on a Thursday afternoon last August. Sometimes I understand why he was here. It's so pretty. Um, that day I don't understand because it, it was vicious that day. There's a cross along the Conewago Creek where Janet Keller's son was killed last year. There's also a warning how Joe Keller died. One of the kids decided to play in the foam under on the underside of the dam and as she walked into it was pulled under and Joe went in to rescue her and it held Joe under. The York County teenager was one of 13 people just here in the Susquehanna Valley who have lost their lives in Lowhead Dam since 1990. Two others died in this accident when their boat was trapped at the Red Hill Dam near Three Mile Island. Both accidents were in some ways best case scenarios. People saw the victims go under and tried to help immediately. So why did no one survive? If you could part the waters at a low head dam, this is what you'd find. This is the Red Hill Dam where those two men died. Now the river is low today, so you can see what's normally underwater. But when the river is pouring over this dam, it's a whole different picture here. These rocky outcrops and calm pools become death traps. Once the water pushes you down here, there's no escape. To show just how little anyone can do to help, we've put a dummy and an onboard camera in this canoe. In a moment, it will go over the Dock Street Dam in Harrisburg. Let it run a little bit. River Rescue is standing by on shore, and they will try to rescue the victim. First, notice how difficult it is to even see the dam from upstream, and watch how quickly it pulls the canoe and the victim underwater. survival rate in that situation right there, we're probably looking at 15 minutes on a good side. But it's five minutes at best before rescuers can even reach the river. Five minutes, and this is what is happening to you. The circulation of the hydraulic of the dam will constantly keep churning the victim around and around and around. After five minutes, rescuers get the go-ahead. Boat in the dam, we got a boat in the dam. We got one person that appears that's in the dam. Once they get in position near the dam, all they can do is try to snag the canoe with a grappling hook. If the victim somehow stayed with the canoe, they might have a rescue. But the first hook misses. Time is slipping away. If we get it too much longer in a rescue attempt like that, it almost going to be a recovery. We lost sight of the person. We lost sight of the victim. Minutes pass by. On their second attempt, the rescuers catch the canoe. Yeah, you're on the boat, you're on the boat. And moments later, the victim's body comes to the surface. Confirm there's only one victim at this time. We have a confirmation there was only one victim in the boat. I was very upset, very angry. Dave and Janet Keller's pain was made worse when they learned the dam that killed their 14-year-old son has no use. Most low-head dams in the state are relics, leftover public work projects from the 30s or antiques from the century before. And most of these killing machines are not marked. 
There's no law that requires warning signs or buoys around low head dams. In fact, dam owners have to get a permit from the state to put up markings. You know, we can put up signs at these dams. We can put up a life ring like this, this one here at, at every dam in Pennsylvania. But until that happens, you need a survival plan. When you get in the water, wear a flotation device, look for warnings, know the area, and keep your distance. Talk with someone, either to launch ramp or local sporting goods stores or fishermen in the area. Uh, find out what you can expect to find and just how far your distances are and keep that distance. Now, if you ever have the misfortune, the horrible misfortune of getting trapped in a low head dam, River rescuers say there's really only one way to escape, and that is if you can somehow get your bearings down there to crawl your way along the river bottom until you clear your way of the underwater hydraulic cycle below the dam that keeps pulling you down. Now, they don't know anyone who has done that, but they have heard stories of people managing to get out that way, and of course, it may be your only chance. One of them put it well, though. He said you wouldn't want to take that trip. No. Um, you know, for as many dams as there are, and as dangerous as they are, what are they used for again? Well. Many of them aren't used for anything now. Uh, some were built in the 1800s to power sawmills and grist mills. Uh, some were built in the 30s as public work projects to form recreation pools behind the dams or for flood control. But uh, in many examples, people don't even know what they were built for. I have different accounts of why the Dock Street Dam in Harrisburg was built. No one is really sure. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. And we should credit the fine folks of the Harrisburg River Rescue who are out there working with us and our photographers John Campbell and Mike Thomas who did a gangbusters job getting all that video. Few people have ever seen firsthand what you are seeing right now. Fewer still have survived to talk about it. This is what happens when you get too close to a low head dam. There are thousands of these death traps on the creeks and rivers in Pennsylvania. Most have no warning markings and many have no use at all. Tonight, how you can avoid becoming a victim of these dams of death. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Hicks. Earlier this month, we aired a News 8 special called Keep Your Distance. In it, we showed you powerful pictures of what happens to people who are caught in the death grip of a low head dam. We received such a huge response from people who saw it that we decided on this, the eve of Labor Day weekend, one of the busiest weekends on the water, to bring you this half hour News 8 special. Tonight, you will hear from a victim who remarkably survived a deadly low head dam accident. And we'll find out why many of these dams have no warning markings and why they're here in the first place. Those two questions still plague a York County couple whose 14-year-old son was killed on a Thursday afternoon last August in a low head dam on the Conewago Creek. Sometimes I understand why he was here. It's so pretty. Um, that day I don't understand because it, it was vicious that day. There's a cross along the Conewago Creek where Janet Keller's son was killed last year. There's also a warning how Joe Keller died. One of the kids decided to play in the foam under, on the underside of the dam and as she walked into it, was pulled under and Joe went in to rescue her and it held Joe under. The York County teenager was one of 13 people just here in the Susquehanna Valley who have lost their lives in Lowhead Dam since 1990. Two others died in this accident when their boat was trapped at the Red Hill Dam near Three Mile Island. Both accidents were in some ways best case scenarios. People saw the victims go under and tried to help immediately. So why did no one survive? If you could part the waters at a Lowhead Dam, this is what you'd find. This is the Red Hill Dam where those two men died. Now, the river is low today, so you can see what's normally underwater. But when the river is pouring over this dam, it's a whole different picture here. These rocky outcrops and calm pools become death traps. Once the water pushes you down here, there's no escape. The boat is capsized. At this point, the victim is not visible. This is how most people see a low head dam accident, a disaster played out on the evening news. The river batters an empty boat. We cannot see the boat. The boat is under the water. Rescuers search for bodies. We lost sight of the person. We lost sight of the victim. The news cameras capture the action, but never the accident itself. Today, we will change that. 
We're on the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg, just above the Dock Street Dam. We're going to show you exactly why low head dams are so dangerous, how quickly they can catch you and how quickly they can kill you. We have a couple of boats, a few foam rubber dummies, and this onboard camera. The Harrisburg River Rescue Crew is joining us today. They're going to be using this as a training mission. And what we're about to show you will drive home the warning that the only way to avoid dying in a low head dam is to keep your distance. This is a drowning machine. It's, the trade name is a drowning machine. It's a killer machine. Steve Ketterer is the commander of Harrisburg River Rescue. He has pulled his share of bodies from the Dock Street Dam. In the past 20 years, 17 people have drowned here. Three of them died in this accident in June 1990. They anchored their boat downstream, but too close to the dam, and crossed what Ketterer calls the magic line. If the craft gets into a certain point of the boil line, it will actually just grab it, suck it right into it. It's a phenomenon we'll explain later, but first, we're going to recreate the accident. You're all right. Yeah, you're well below the boil. Come on up. River rescue teams carefully put our boat with the dummies on board in position near that magic line downstream. And through the onboard camera, you will see and hear what happens if you don't keep your distance. Within seconds, the boat and everyone in it are sucked under and underwater is a dizzying, dangerous flood of powerful currents sucking you deeper, shooting you to the surface, and sucking you back to the bottom. This is what it's like to die in a low head dam. every time and here's why the river picks up speed as it's squeezed over the dam that fast moving water passing over the dam plunges to the river bottom and forces the water down there back up to the surface but that water is then sucked back toward the dam by the water plunging to the bottom it creates an endless cycle down to the bottom up to the surface toward the dam back down to the bottom it's like crawling in a front-loading automatic washer, pull the door shut, and have somebody slug the machine with a handful of quarters. You're not going to have a second chance, a chance to get out, even if you're wearing a life jacket. Five years ago, one victim did get a second chance. He was boating just below this low head dam, the Dock Street Dam in Harrisburg, when he was sucked into it, just like the video you saw. We'll talk to him next, and we'll hear from one of the rescuers who helped save him. Stay with us. We have a sighting of a victim, a possible victim, in the dam at the boat, near the boat. Welcome back. Five years ago, there was a tragic accident on the Lowhead Dam behind me, the Dock Street Dam in Harrisburg. 29-year-old David Hodrick died. Two of his friends did not. Dale Wickard is one of the survivors. Joe Ketterer is one of the rescuers who helped save him. Let's start with you, Dale. Tell us how you got into trouble in the first place that night. Well, I first got in trouble was that we were uh, actually trying to find a fishing spot that uh, was near the, near the water, and we kept trying to get close to the dam. The current going away from the dam was pretty strong and uh, wouldn't support the anchor, wouldn't support the boat. Uh, by going a little bit closer to the dam is when I got in trouble. I crossed the line, imaginary line that I could not see, and it actually lifted my boat up, forced it into the dam. Within seconds, the boat was parallel with the dam. The water was filling the boat. Uh, John and David uh, were taking their clothing off and trying to uh, at that point, they were trying to just to get away from the dam. When they jumped off the boat uh, at the same time, it capsized the boat with me still in, in the boat. And because I had uh, two anchors on both sides of the boat, I was able to get a, a lifeline from the anchor to pull myself up to the boat. Now, this is 1.30 in the morning, so it was dark, but was the experience somewhat like the video that we just showed? It, a lot like the video. It's kind of scary watching the fact that I couldn't even watch all the videos. It was, uh, 
reminded me of turning over. And what was going through your mind? What was it like when you were in there, the, the power and the currents? The current was so strong, I could say, if it wouldn't have been for the rope that was attached to my boat, uh, I was literally being sucked underneath the water. And uh, unbelievable current. It was just like a va gigantic vacuum under the water that was pulling myself uh, underneath. Uh, just holding on and trying to survive was all we were thinking of. And you were in there for four hours? Possibly four hours. How did you stay alive? Uh, I have four children and uh, just the will to live, I guess. You know that I didn't want to die that way. And that kept me, uh, I focused on, actually I focused on the fish jumping over the, trying to jump over the dam, which kept me, uh, my mind focused on something. And, uh, I didn't have any feelings in my legs, my arms were numb. Now you were wearing a flotation device and you were holding on to this fiberglass uh, boat, oh, correct? Correct. How were you eventually rescued? John, after David uh, left us, uh, we decided we had to do something. And uh, John decided that he would make the attempt to try to break, break away. John, uh, had we had one flotation device left. John took that and brought his knees up to the boat and actually pushed away from the boat and actually caught the current going away from the dam. And just the current took him downstream. And I could hear John saying, you know, I'll get help for you. And it seemed like uh, hours went by from that point on. And by that point, David had already gone under? David had already gone under uh, before John made that attempt to go. And how did the rescuers eventually reach you? Well, I could see the, the uh, fire trucks and, and the uh, emergency equipment coming uh, onto the bridge. And it was real foggy and rainy that uh, that morning, and I could see a light coming in the water towards me. And uh, it got close enough where I made voice contact with that person on the boat. And I told him that I was still okay, that if they didn't get here soon, they're not going to hold on any longer. The gentleman that uh, threw the life uh, uh, preserver at me mm -hmm. made one hell of a throw. It was directly over the boat, and I was able to uh, grab a hold of it the first cast wrap it around my body and I didn't want to leave go at first because that was the secure that the I had for the boat. The boat. Sure. And once he, uh, you know, uh, I could feel them snugging me and I was able to let go of the boat that was holding me up and uh, they retrieved me in the water as they were backing downstream. Now Joe Ketterer is one of the rescuers who was on that rescue that night. What are the chances of someone like Dale surviving an accident like that, Joe? Well, what he did was uh, exactly correct. He stayed with the, the craft that, that does have flotation in it, and he did have some type of flotation device on. And when you go out to a call like this, what is the standard approach, or is there a standard approach? Yeah, here at the Dock Street Dam, we, there are a few other type of rescue techniques we can use, but because the Dock Street Dam is about three quarters of a mile across from East Shore to West Shore side, we have to use the technique we call the two-boat tether. Uh, and that's the technique we used uh, in Dale's situation, where we send uh, two boats in, uh, both are under power. One is uh, a flotation uh, a boat that has high freeboard, that has a uh, 50 foot of line attached to the back end on a harness and attached to another boat that's past the boil line. And both boats go in under power and then uh, the operator of the boat that's going in, the rescue boat that's going in, has another person Front of it to throw the line, and that's what happened with the Dale's cruiser. I understand when river rescuers get a call for a low head dam rescue, you experience an enormous amount of fear. Yes, when we first get the call and it comes across and it's dispatched and it's a dam rescue, uh, everybody's adrenaline is flowing and uh, we have no idea uh, what we're going to run into when we get down there, and uh, we're hoping it's not as serious as it usually is, and the weather is, is perfect and everything, but like in Dale's situation, it wasn't. It was like four, right, four something in the morning, it was raining, it was foggy. So some of the techniques that we normally teach our students, uh, we could not really apply. Uh, and one of them is where the uh, OIC or the commander would call the shots from the shore on this side and look out through uh, binoculars. We were actually on top of the bridge with lights down in, and the commander was calling the shots there. So there was a lot of communication between all the boats especially the boat that was actually going into the dam to rescue. Thank you, Joe. Well, you're probably wondering by now, why are these low head dams here in the first place? We will answer that question when we come back. Stay with us. When 
once you're in the hydraulic, uh, chances of survival are minimal. Welcome back. There are more than 2,000 low head dams on the creeks and rivers in Pennsylvania. Dan Martin is a boating safety specialist with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Dan, why are these low head dams built in the first place? Well, they were built for all sorts of reasons. I called the city of Harrisburg to find out exactly why this dam was built. They tell me in 1913 this dam was built as an impoundment to mix sewage with the river water. Mm -hmm. Apparently in the summer when, uh, when the river went down, the sewage would dump, raw sewage would dump right in the banks. So they impounded the river here to mix the sewage with the water. Also, there's a water filtration plant on City Island, and they needed more water to make the filtration system work better. So and that's other why dams, this one was other ones have been built for recreation, uh, power generation, a whole so variety of reasons. Built for lumber, built for power generation, uh, grist mills, all sorts of reasons, going back to the time when the state was first settled. Now, are many of them relics? Are they used still? Many of them are relics. Mm -hmm. And some are still used, as this one is now, for, to create a pool for recreational boating. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a way that the owners register their low-head dams so there's a, a, a state map of where they all are, something like that? No, there's no state map uh, showing all the dams. Um, there are uh, many uh, river maps that show hazards on the rivers. For example, there are maps of the Susquehanna River that mm -hmm. show the dams that are in place. Uh, but many boaters uh, don't know they're there, and it is the boater's responsibility or someone on the water to know what hazards are on the water. It's kind of cruel, but it, that, is, that is the case. And of course, not all these dams are marked. Some of them have no warning signs. That's true, but that's usually on the smaller uh, mm -hmm. waterways. Mm -hmm. uh, the larger uh, uh, waterways, like the, the Susquehanna River, they're, they're well marked. But we should point out, in the case of Joe Keller, who was profiled early in the piece that we ran, uh, he was killed in a very small creek. In fact, just a little tributary to this creek. It doesn't take much water to drown someone. Mm -hmm. Many people have drowned in water that they could have stood up in and survived. Mm -hmm. And there are no laws, I understand, that require owners to mark these dams. Is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Now, if I get trapped in a low head dam, what, what should I do? Is there a way to get out? Well, if you capsize, if your boat's capsized or your boat's with you, you want to stay with the boat. You want to stay on top of anything that'll float. You don't want to try to swim for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there's no boat there and you're trapped in a low head dam, you want to try to work your way towards shore, the closest shore, swimming across the current. If you can't do that, the one last hope you'd have would be to swim to the bottom and work your way along the bottom till you get clear of the hydraulic mm -hmm. and then come to the surface. It would be very difficult even for a trained expert to do. Because if you try and swim across the top, that hydraulic will just That's, suck you It right will grab you, down. yeah. It's not something anyone's actually tried, to my knowledge, and mm -hmm. it's something no one should try. The best thing to do and the only thing to do when involved with dams, recreational boating, swimming, anything, is to simply just stay away from it. Mm -hmm. Dan Martin, thanks for being with us tonight. And as Dan mentioned, there are no laws requiring people to mark these dams, but there is an effort going on in Harrisburg to make a law that would require that, and a low-head dam victim's family is behind that effort. We'll talk to them right after this. Stay with us. Sometimes I'm very angry because I'm afraid it's going to happen to another kid that somebody else is going to be in the same boat we are. Welcome back. We started this News 8 special tonight with the story of 14-year-old Joe Keller. Joe was killed in a low-head dam on the Conewago Creek last year. Joe's parents, Dave and Janet Keller, are with us tonight. When this accident happened, you were sad, of course, but you were also angry. Explain why. We're angry because there's a low head dam sitting there that has no purpose, no use, and it's a death trap. It's just like an accident looking for a place to happen. What was the origin of this dam that Joe was killed in? Uh, I'm not sure when it was built, but it was originally built as a, to feed the mill, Wurtz Mill. Mm -hmm. There's actually two dams in that area that feed the mill. One backs up the main creek, and then the spur comes off, which is the one that Joe got caught in. So this hasn't been used so, for years. The mill's been no, and it, and it really isn't even on the, the actual Conewago Creek. It's mm -hmm. on a man-made spur to the creek, which is what really upset me when I first saw that. And know. my understanding is uh, that this dam was not even clearly marked as being something that was dangerous for these kids. Never. No. Not till after the accident did they mark it at all. Mm -hmm. Now, you are working with State Representative Todd Platts. He's the state representative in your district. 
trying to get some legislative effort in Harrisburg. What are you trying to do? Well, uh, basically, I went to see Todd because, you know, I figured if anybody can help us, he can. And he's working, he's going to set up a meeting, if he can, with DER and the uh, Boat and Fish Commission and discuss some legislation proposals that he has in the works for actually marking these dams and maintaining them and actually uh, repairing them if necessary. And you would like to see this particular dam where your son was killed torn down? Actually, yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no real fix for that dam other than it needs to be. Has there been any of. progress on that? No. Not that we know of. Uh, it, it just it, it's a long, slow process. Hopefully now, we'll get there. As we mentioned early on, uh, Joe Keller, your son, was killed trying to rescue a girl who had fallen in or had, had actually slipped into that low head dam and he is going to be awarded the Boy Scouts of America life-saving medal with the cross palms in September. Yes. That's right. That's, that's a very rare Boy Scout award that uh, unfortunately most recipients are you know, a posthumous award and that's just very sad but true. What would you like to see happen to these low head dams? We're sitting at probably the, the, uh, the poster child of low head dams, so to speak, the Dock Street Dam. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice if we could fix them, that they wouldn't have hydraulics? Yes. yes. Today, so? That is and possible. It is possible. It's it possible is. to have them fixed. How do they do that? Do you know? Um, if you can build up the lower side of the dam with rocks mm -hmm. or what have you, and they get cascade down over them, mm -hmm. it gets rid of the hydraulics. It's a very simple fix. I'm sure it's expensive, but it's better than losing a child or a husband or a wife or whoever. And so the water is coming down at an angle rather right. than straight over. Right. Very interesting. Dave and Janet Keller, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Labor Day weekend is, of course, one of the busiest weekends on the water, and many of you watching right now will be out there on the water this weekend. So please be safe. Always wear a personal flotation device. Know the area where you're boating or fishing, and keep your distance from these dams of death. I'm Brad Hicks. Good night. Probably the scariest situation that any water rescuer is going to face when they initially get that call that someone's trapped in the dam or a boat has gone over the dam. Boat in the dam. We got a boat in the dam. We got one person that appears that's in the dam.